Luke and I were so close. He knew me and my story as well as he knew any of the others that he interviewed. To many people, only humans are real and talk to one another. But many of the people in Acts, like Luke, perceived of me as being just as real and just as tangible as any of their other friends. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to Christians on the day of Pentecost. No other character in the book of Acts was nearly as important as the Holy Spirit, and the early Christians knew it. Many people who read the New Testament refer to me as an it. Now, I think this comes from many Bible translators using the Holy Spirit, which makes me sound more like a thing than a person. Actually, the Bible should translate the words as the Holy Spirit sometimes and Holy Spirit other times. Try using Holy Spirit sometime and see if that makes me seem like more of a real person in your own mind. After all, nobody would call you the Kyle or the Jessica. The naming issue interests me because the New Testament refers to the masculine forms of God the Father and God the Son. So there's been a natural association by many people to refer to me in the masculine context as well. Jesus sometimes referred to me as he, as in he will testify about me. One way to think about me is to think of wind or air, which is what I'm named after. Like the air that fills your lungs, I indwell both men and women to go where I want, to go where I'm needed, and to think and act as God, not as a mere man or woman. I multitask better than any woman, and most certainly better than any man. I act where and when I want, as I am needed and invited. And my home includes an indwelling in each Christian. Now, um, only one thing amazes Jesus in me, the choices of human beings. Everything else in the universe makes perfect sense. I mean, Jesus was usually amazed at how some people made choices based on their faith or lack of faith. Me, I just stand amazed at so many of their choices. Before the beginning of time, we were sure that Jesus was going to have to come to earth to save mankind from their sins. We knew that he would eventually have to sacrifice his life in order to make that happen. Me, I was still amazed that the Jewish leaders would kill their only hope of redemption, the Messiah they'd been waiting for for so long. The Father was not amazed. Uh, Jesus was not amazed, but I was. But I was not amazed that Jesus sent me back to empower the first Christians. We'd been planning for that to happen for eons. I mean, <laughs> you can't begin to imagine how some of those conversations went. Not with words, like humans, but imagine a conversation going something like this. Um, Jesus said to me, you just have to go do for the believers what I did for them when I was alive, but you have it easier. You only have to live inside of them. You don't even have to have your own body. You just live inside the ones they already have and you get to give them special gifts and powers that I wasn't allowed to give them. Now, don't get me wrong, but that kind of creeped me out at the time. Think creepers on your Facebook page. Now imagine how I think you feel if I go creeping around inside your soul and mind. So, I'm like a polite guest. When you want me around, you have to invite me to be an active part of your life. When you don't want me around, just ignore me, and I will usually not bother you. The first apostles were not sure what to make of it when Jesus told them I was coming back to replace him. And he didn't give them a whole lot of information, so they had to piece together clues like, uh, the Holy Spirit will be a counselor, a comforter, and, uh, and an advocate. With what Jesus told them, they probably thought I was a camp counselor or a good lawyer. 
Jesus always did like to make the truth a really good surprise. On Pentecost, I thought it would be interesting to empower the apostles in a way they did not expect. And I blew into their presence like a tornado and gave them the power to speak in any language their listener could understand. Just for a little extra theater, I used the first holograms, flames of fire all over their bodies. They jumped up, wouldn't you? And began preaching to everybody nearby. I mean, I wasn't amazed that they used their new power to preach the gospel. It's what Jesus had been training them to do. I just had to give them a little extra power boost. From then on, I gave the apostles whatever kind of power boost they needed to keep sharing the gospel and to start establishing the early church. Luke wrote about some of the more dramatic actions of the apostles, healing blind people, healing lame people, raising dead people, and escaping from jails. These were certainly attention grabbers and helped jumpstart the growth of Christianity. When you want to establish authority, <laughs> there's nothing like healing blindness or raising someone from the dead. Sometimes, to be even more dramatic, I would let Peter's shadow or Paul's handkerchief do the healing. That got the attention of everybody. For the long-term growth of the kingdom, there were many other things I did that were more amazing. When any of the believers needed to remember the gospel and to have the wherewithal to teach it, I made that happen. Once I did that with such power that the Sanhedrin was shocked that lowly fishermen could talk like they had PhDs. Or like with Philip, sometimes I would just put people in the right place at the right time to share the gospel. I've continued to do both of those things with believers, especially when they ask me to do so. More amazing than that? The seven types of fruit that I give to believers today who are willing to act for the benefit of the kingdom. The fruit of the supernatural ability to love all people, especially the ones that are tough to love. I don't give them the ability to love in the way Hollywood promotes, but with the unconditional, obedient love that God commands. I empower people to bless and want blessings for anybody who needs it, even for their enemies. With this fruit, the hated can love those who hate, and the neglected can love those who neglect. I give this fruit of love to anyone who wants it badly enough to use it. I give the fruit of joy. Not the gift of happiness, especially the kinds of happiness that the world promotes. I give the type of joy that allows you to be thankful when times are tough. That allows you to see the sunset in your mind when your eyes are blind. The kind of joy that sees the good in people. The kind of joy that allows you to share Jesus because he made you joyful. I give the fruit of peace. In this world, you will have tribulation, but you can have peace in your heart because you know Jesus has overcome the world and you are on the winning side. <laughs> in this crazy, chaotic, pressure-paced world, most people are seeking a little peace. You can have the peace you want if you ask for this gift from me. With this fruit, you can also be a peacemaker. We so value peacemaking that anybody who is a peacemaker gets the special title, Child of God. Patience and kindness are two for fruits. If I give you the fruit of love, you also get the fruit of patience and kindness because love is patient and kind. These are fruit that Jesus demonstrated so well and so often. <laughs> if you'd been him, can you imagine how many times you would have wanted to punch one of the apostles or strike the Pharisees with leprosy or lameness or any of the other things? God is so patient that he wants everyone to go to heaven so badly that he allowed Jesus to be sacrificed. Loving and patient people are kind. I give the fruit of goodness and self-control, twin fruit. It takes immense self-control to maintain your goodness and withstand the temptations of the world. And it takes goodness 
to want to have that kind of self-control. Do you know why children were so attracted to Jesus? Why so many of the poor and mistreated wanted to be around him? He was gentle. Gentleness, one of those gifts that Jesus so often exhibited, can be yours for the asking. Lastly, I give the gift of faithfulness. I started demonstrating this so powerfully in Acts. As believers acted faithfully, I empowered them more and more. And with time, the miraculous powers were not needed so much, but faithfulness was needed more and more. Faithfulness was needed to endure persecution from the Jews, and as persecution from the Romans increased, faithfulness needed when false teachers promoted harmful ideas. And faithfulness was going to be needed when Jesus did not return to earth as soon as people expected and wanted. This is what I want you to remember about Luke's Book of Acts. The early believers were faithful to grow the kingdom against all sorts of opposition. I empowered them to do so. Through my empowerment, you can be faithful to do the same.